I'd really like to thank the organizers for the chance to come uh, lecture at the summer school. It's a great privilege and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank my other lecturers for their willingness to move their lectures around uh, on account of my flight delays. So I was on an airplane on Tuesday night in New York and uh, jet fuel started spurting out of the wing while we were on the runway. And uh, so anyway, so that's led to a bit of a backup and but I'm here now. So I'm very glad to see you guys. So how are you? Good, okay, all right. So hopefully you guys have had a fantastic uh, summer school so far, and hopefully I don't let you down too much uh, with my last few lectures. Um, so I was asked to talk about beyond the standard model at the TEV scale, uh, which also is more or less the focus of my research. Of course, this is an incredibly broad topic, right? It covers a lot of different ground. Um, and the way that I want to handle it is going to be to focus on a few particular things that I think um, are exceptionally well motivated to make sure we understand them very carefully uh, and then to try to build up around that a more complete picture of what physics beyond the standard model at the TEV scale might mean. Um, so I do want to say this is not going to be maybe your PhD advisor's version of beyond the standard model. Um, in the sense that, you know, we've had beyond the standard model as long as we've had the standard model. In some sense, we've had beyond the standard model longer than we've had the standard model, right? Because many of the things uh, that we call beyond the standard model physics don't actually, you know, those predated uh, the establishment of the standard model itself. And we sort of had a long time where we had these ideas for physics beyond the standard model, and we didn't have a lot of data that was really capable of interrogating those ideas. And so we ended up in a situation where we had some dominant paradigms, for example, minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model, right? That was a dominant paradigm that sort of had 30 years to settle in and become the most important thing that people thought about when they thought about physics beyond the standard model. Um, but we're in this amazing era that is rich in data, right? So we have the Large Hadron Collider, which is giving us access to physics at the TEV scale uh, in an unprecedented way, but we also have access to a lot of interesting astrophysical and cosmological information that is also interrogating our ideas about physics at the TEV scale. And uh, that data so far, right, that data has not found evidence for anything beyond the standard model, okay? So uh, that means that uh, our paradigms, the ideas that we've had for the last 30 years or so for physics beyond the standard model, especially at the TEV scale, are really actual, you know, actually under a little bit of strain. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's not my job to give you the sort of usual traditional version of uh, beyond the standard model at the TEV scale lectures about familiar things from the last 30 years. It's really my job to tell you uh, about what ideas seem interesting now and what ideas might be interesting moving forward because uh, from your perspective, with your careers looking forward in the future, that's what really counts. Okay, so um, I will hope to keep this um, with an eye towards interesting alternatives to make sure we know uh, what the important things are but also what the interesting and exciting possibilities might be in the future. Okay, so just to outline uh, broadly what I want to talk about in the course of these lectures, um, I want to actually start out with a sort of a prologue uh, on the philosophy of effective field theory. Um, so many of you hopefully have some intuition for what it means to think about the standard model in the context of effective field theory. And I know you've seen various examples of that throughout the lectures so far at the summer school, but I really want to pause and just spend a little bit of time thinking about the systematics of effective field theory what it is we really mean when we talk about effective field theory in the standard model, because that really undergirds, it really underlies a lot of the philosophy of thinking about physics beyond the standard model. So we'll just start with some sort of background thinking about effective field theory, how it applies to the standard model, uh, and then we'll sort of move into three different parts. Um, you can tell what I spend most of my time thinking about, because part one is going to be on hierarchy problems, part two will be on hierarchy solutions, and part three is going to be on everything else. Uh, but loosely speaking, what that means is uh, I want to spend most of uh, this first lecture and the second lecture today um, thinking a little bit about the sorts of theoretical problems that motivate us to think about physics beyond the standard model at the TEV scale. And I want to really think about this very carefully because we're in a sort of funny era where sometimes people suggest that there maybe is no hierarchy problem associated with the weak scale. And so if anything else, it's my job not to convince you of a particular solution, but just that the problem is a real and robust one. So we'll spend a lot of time thinking in detail about what that might mean. Uh, given that hopefully we all believe in the problem at some point, then we'll move on to talking about possible solutions. And I'll focus a little bit on different classes of solutions. Uh, some of these classes of solutions have theoretical realizations that we've thought about over the last 
uh, 20, 30 years. Some of them have theoretical realizations that are much more new. Uh, and I will try to expose you both to the older traditional ideas and some newer, more radical ideas, all in the context of trying to solve the hierarchy problem and look for extensions of the standard model at the TEV scale. And then in the last lecture, um, I want to lump in a bunch of other things that uh, are also things that we think of as motivated extensions of the standard model, but with a particular eye towards what it might mean for physics at the TEV scale. So in particular, I'll think a little bit about the strong CP problem at the TEV scale. Of course, you've already been hearing a lot about axions as a solution to strong CP, but there are other solutions and ones that might show up at different energy scales. Uh, I also will talk a little bit about gauge coupling unification. Of course, the phenomenon of gauge coupling unification is something that happens at scales well beyond the TeV scale, but very suggestively it points to the existence of new states near the TeV scale. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the origin of the baryon antibaryon asymmetry, which is just another observed fact of nature, uh, and why, what that might have in connection to the TeV scale. And we'll end with a sort of optimistic looking towards the future, not just what we have right now, both in terms of data sets, experiments, and theories, but what sort of data sets, experiments, and theories might be important over the time scales of your careers. Okay, so that's the sort of outline, and uh, let's get to it. Okay. So uh, I'm talking now to you guys about beyond the standard model of the TEV scale, so we should define what we mean by all of those words. Um, so by standard model, thank you, you, thankfully you had um, some really nice lectures by Yossi last week uh, on the standard model itself. And so from my perspective, what I'm going to take the standard model to mean is uh, all of the observed matter representations that we fit into the standard model, right? So all the three generations of quarks and leptons, uh, the single Higgs double look that we appear to have seen so far at the LHC, and then, of course, the gauge degrees of freedom uh, that um, communicate the, uh, the forces of the standard model itself. Okay, so those are the fields. Uh, and then the other thing that we specify by really saying standard model is that we take those fields and we take the intrinsic symmetries of those fields, right, the gauge symmetries, and then we just write down all renormalizable interactions that are allowed in our quantum field theory, right? With those field degrees of freedom subject to the gauge symmetries of the standard model uh, and subject to Lorentz invariance, okay? Uh, in particular, by all renormalizable interactions, that means either marginal interactions, so things like the Yukawa interactions, uh, or the couplings between gauge fields and matter fields, and then relevant interactions, which are just uh, the possibly allowed mass terms in the theory, which of course in the standard model are constrained by symmetries to be a very, very small number. Okay, so the notion that um, you should specify your field theory by specifying the field content and then writing down all of the renormalizable interactions with non-zero coefficients, uh, this sort of satisfies what we think of as the totalitarian principle in a quantum field theory, right? That is that uh, the total totalitarian principle, loosely speaking, is um, all of the possible interactions that are allowed by the underlying symmetries of the theory will, of course, be present at some level. And, you know, that's just a manifestation of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, anything, you know, anything that is allowed in some sense by the, the underlying structure of your theory does happen with some probability. And so in the context of a quantum field theory, that means uh, there are various couplings and interactions that will appear at some level as long as they're allowed by the symmetries. Okay. So that's the standard model. Uh, here, of course, by the way, is you know, we usually write it handily on a mug, uh, and I think everyone knows these days that this extra Hermitian conjugate is superfluous. Um, so having defined the standard model in this way, beyond the standard model means anything that is not contained in these ingredients. Okay, so it could be new fields, right? It could be additional uh, field degrees of freedom beyond the fields of the standard model, but it could also be irrelevant operators, right? It could just be operators involving standard model fields themselves, but not operators that we expect to appear at the marginal or relevant level uh, using the normal power counting arguments in field theory. So either one of these things, right, are physics beyond the standard model. Um, and uh, we'll spend uh, at least the next uh, couple of slides thinking a little bit more about why both of those things qualify as physics beyond the standard model. Okay. All right. So. Um, I've just made a big deal about the fact that beyond the standard model could include new fields, they could be new light degrees of freedom, but it also could include new interactions between standard model fields that are just not contained in the list of relevant and marginal interactions allowed by the symmetries. So what do I mean by irrelevant operators? Now this is something uh, hopefully that we all learn uh, in our early days of learning quantum field theory, but it's always good to remind ourselves how it works uh, just so we're thinking in the right way. Um, so, you know, let's just think, think about it in the context of a, a, the, one of the simplest possible field theories 
in four dimensions, just consider uh, the scalar field, the uh, uh, field theory of a real scalar in four dimensions. And let's just imagine that we wrote down some polynomial potential for that scalar. So we can write down the action. There's some kinetic term. We can write down something that involves, uh, say, two powers of the, the mass. I'm going to imagine, just for simplicity, the scalar field has a Z2 exchange symmetry under which the scalar goes to minus the scalar. That way, we can turn off odd powers of the field. Uh, it's just a convenience so I can fit a nice polynomial in one line. So subject to that, we've got a kinetic term. We can write down a mass term that goes like the field squared. We can write down a quartic interaction. Uh, we could write down a sextic interaction. And of course, we could go on writing down interactions until we got tired, uh, but this at least fits in one line. OK. Um, so how do we analyze what this theory does? I mean, what we want to do with any quantum field theory, what we think about when we define a quantum field theory is we write down the quantum field theory at some high energy scale at which we imagine the theory to be defined. And then we just want to ask the question, given the quantum field theory defined at that scale, what does it do as we go to lower and lower energies? What is the emergent phenomena that happens in this field theory as we go to the far infrared? Okay. So to figure that out, we just use power counting, right? At the end of the day, quantum field theory is very fancy, but all we're really doing is dimensional analysis. Um, so in any dimensions, right, the dimensions of length and the action are fixed in natural units. And so then we can just go ahead and work out uh, what is the relativistic power counting, what are the mass dimensions or energy dimensions of all of the parameters that appear in this action. Uh, so of course, it's easy to work out the measure. Uh, it's easy to work out that the scalar field in four dimensions has uh, dimensions of mass or energy. The mass term, of course, has dimension of mass squared. This quartic interaction is dimensionless. Uh, and the sexic interaction has uh, dimensions of 1 over mass squared. Okay. So given that, right, if we define the theory at some uh, energy scale or some length scale, then we can go study it uh, at long distances by taking some scaling limit that just stretches our distances out to, to very much larger ones and ask again, what does the field theory do as we go from short distances where we define the theory to much longer distances? So we can do that by just taking a scaling limit, right? So we can, we can take uh, our normal uh, coordinate x and we can rescale it by some parameter I'll call s. Uh, and we can take the scaling limit of going to long distances by keeping the Lorentz structure of our positions fixed and just taking this parameter s to infinity. Okay, that takes us sort of uniformly out to long distances. Um, now, of course, if we actually, if we do that, what that's going to do, one of the things it's going to do, it's going to rescale. It's going to give us a huge coefficient to the kinetic term. Uh, and it's a little harder to evaluate. Normally, we understand the fluctuations in a quantum field theory and the interactions with respect to canonically normalized fields. So the first thing we have to do is canonically normalize our field so that it's, we know what we mean by a propagating degree of freedom. Once we do that, so that's just a simple rescaling of uh, the fields by the scaling parameter s. That will pull all the scaling that we get out of the kinetic term and give us canonically normalized fields. And then we can look at the rest of the terms in this action in this long distance scaling limit. We can just ask, what do they do? Right. So uh, this is what we get. Right. So we've rescaled the kinetic terms uh, so that they don't depend on the scaling parameter s. And then we just look at all the other terms in our action, and we ask, what powers do they scale with as we go to longer and longer distances? And not surprisingly, right, the answer is given by what we would expect from our relativistic power counting. So these mass terms, uh, where the parameter of the mass term, this polynomial that goes like phi squared, that scales like s squared. So as we go to longer and longer distances, of course, this thing blows up like s squared. It becomes increasingly important. Therefore, we call it a relevant interaction, right? Uh, this term, this quartic interaction, uh, that, that classically at least was dimensionless, this thing at least classically uh, is constant in S, so at any different length scale, it's equally important. It doesn't become radically more or less important at different length scales, so we call that marginal. And then the sextic interaction, uh, the sextic interaction goes like uh, 1 over 2 powers of the scaling parameter S, so as we take S to be large, this thing becomes less and less important and becomes irrelevant. So this is how we normally organize our thinking in a quantum field theory. In principle, I could write down lots of different interactions uh, at some scale with various different coefficients. Some of them could be uh, relevant operators, marginal or irrelevant operators. But then as we flow to the infrared, as we study the theory at longer and longer distance scales, only the relevant ones and the marginal ones either stay as important as they were or become more and more important. And all of the other ones, all of the irrelevant operators, they become less and less important in the far infrared. OK, so that's what we mean by irrelevant. And when we write down the standard model, we're doing so with an explicit understanding that the only operators that we're going to write down are the marginal and the relevant ones. 
And that seems justified because even if the standard model and the very highest scales at which it exists were defined with some irrelevant operators, we would expect those irrelevant operators, the coefficient, would get smaller and smaller as we flow down to the energy scales at which we live. Okay. All right. Now, it's worth pausing to think about how this interfaces with notions of renormalizability. So, uh, depending on what quantum field theory textbook you learn quantum field theory out of, you might have learned a different way of thinking about marginal and relevant and irrelevant operators that was much more scary sounding, right? Um, so, we al also often call theories with marginal and relevant operators renormalizable, and theories that also include irrelevant operators, we often call them non-renormalizable. Uh, and the reason for that is actually fairly straightforward. If you just ask, what is the counterterm structure in a quantum field theory with all of these different uh, interactions present? Okay. So um, historically, of course, uh, the emphasis was really to think actually about field theories without any irrelevant operators. Uh, and uh, well, let's understand why why that was. So we know in a quantum field theory, right? Uh, we have various loops, virtual processes. These are parametrizing genuine quantum effects. This is what makes the field theory quantum and not classical. Um, and of course, these loops have divergences, and we understand these divergences, well, there are various ways of interpreting them, but uh, certainly if we can measure a physical process at various different scales, then we can remove its dependence on these possible divergences through a normalization procedure. And the way that we do that right is just to add counter terms. So we start with our theory defined at some scale um, with coefficients picked out by some observables. And then we introduce counter terms, which are extra local operators in the theory that are proportional to the operators that are exist in our theory. And their coefficients just exist to absorb any infinities that we get when we do a loop calculation, right? There are various prescriptions about how exactly we want to do it, but that's the role of counter terms. The role of counter terms is to absorb the infinities so that we can simply relate finite physical quantities to other finite physical quantities. Okay. So the criterion of renormalizability, right, is the criterion that we can absorb all of the divergences in a given quantum field theory with a finite number of counter terms. And the reason why we care about that, why that's important, why we care about a finite number of counterterms and not an infinite number of counterterms, is predictivity, right? If we have some number of observables that we can make, some number of observations we can make, measurements of phenomena at different scales, what we'd really like to do is use some of those measurements to fix all of the unknown parameters in our theory and then make predictions for all of the other observations, right? That's, uh, that's what you know, predictiveness in, in physics or in science, that's what it means. We, we make some predictions for something as yet unobserved, and we see that the correctness of the predictions validates our theory. Okay. So if we had an infinite number of counter terms, right, if our theory were not renormalizable, then the thing that we would worry about is that we could no longer make any predictions. Right? We have an infinite number of unknown coefficients, and we would have to make an infinite number of observations to fix all of them to absorb, and then absorb all of the divergences, and we would never be able to predict anything. Right, so we would have to give up and go home. Okay, so that's why, at least historically, for a long time, there was very strong emphasis on the normalizability of quantum field theories. Now, we can see how that works, again, in our simple scalar example. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so again, as a reminder, at least at the, in the scalar field theory example, the theory that just has marginal and relevant interactions, that's purely renormalizable. But adding this irrelevant interaction, I claim, makes the theory non-renormalizable. And now we can see why. Okay. And we can also rock out. <laughs> I, I, I dig that. That's, that's, that's awesome. Okay, I'm glad you're excited about this. Um, all right, so let's just imagine, first let's just start with the part of our scalar field theory that just has these marginal and relevant interactions, right? So the phi squared, phi to the fourth terms plus the kinetic terms. So if we want to go ahead and we compute some loops, okay, the first loop we can write down is just the loop that comes from taking two of the quartic interactions together. All right, we can connect those with propagators and we can make uh, a one-loop diagram. And um, we can go ahead, well, you know, you guys are students, you're young and powerful, you could actually compute this, oopsie, in full detail. I'm old and slow, so all I can do is uh, uh, estimate things. But uh, we take this loop and we want to at least figure out what's the leading divergence. So the leading divergence, right, we take, uh, we have two powers of the coupling, so it goes like lambda squared. Uh, we're going to integrate over the loop momenta running through this loop. Uh, it goes like one over momentum to the fourth, that's from the two propagators uh, running in this loop. And so integrating uh, d4k over k to the fourth, that just gives us a logarithmic divergence, right? If we integrate it up to some uh, finite momentum cutoff, let's call it capital lambda, that means the divergence in this diagram at most goes logarithmically in the cutoff. 
Okay, so no problem. We're quantum field theorists. We know how to uh, deal with divergences. So to deal with the divergences, we can introduce a counter term, which again is just some new local operator in our theory uh, that we use to absorb any divergence. And we say that our you know, renormalized theory consists of our original Bayer Lagrangian uh, plus this counter term, right? And predictions we make using the combinations of these two things will always be finite. And so we say this extra counter term, this just renormalizes this marginal operator. Okay. So, so far, right, as long as we only worried about marginal and relevant operators, we're in good shape. We, we have found a divergence, but we, could only, we only needed to introduce one counter term to absorb it. Okay. But now let's take our full theory, the one that also had this phi to the six interaction. Okay. So if we now have this phi to the six interaction, now we can write down a much more terrifying looking diagram. All right, this is some sort of spider. I guess it has eight legs, right? So this diagram, this is a one loop diagram. I get it by taking two of these phi to the six interactions. So this goes like the phi to the six interaction squared. Uh, the divergence in the loop is the same as the divergence in this example. It's still just a logarithmic divergence. Um, just because it has these two propagators, we're integrating over the one momentum. Okay, so this thing also goes like a logarithmic divergence. But now, to absorb this divergence, right, this thing has eight external lines. So as a local operator, this is proportional to phi to the eighth. And so that means the counter term that we'd have to introduce to our theory to absorb the divergence, to renormalize the theory, this thing must be a local operator proportional to phi to the eighth. But phi to the eighth didn't exist in the theory that we specified, right? We wrote down a theory that had phi squared, phi to the fourth, phi to the sixth, and basta, right? But, uh, but now, actually, to absorb the divergences coming from the irrelevant operator, the phi to the sixth, we have to introduce a new operator uh, proportional to phi to the eighth. So now our theory has an extra term, right? So now, we write a chalkboard. We started out with phi squared plus phi to the fourth plus phi to the sixth. Now to renormalize this guy, we have to add somebody at phi to the eighth. Now if we have this operator that goes like phi to the eighth, now we can write down an operator, or excuse me, a loop diagram proportional to this phi to the eighth. Let me even see if I can get the number of legs right. It has six legs on each side. Right, so this would be a loop diagram proportional to two insertions of the phi to the eighth. Uh, so that thing would also have a logarithmic divergence. Absorbing that logarithmic divergence, in fact, would require us to introduce a counter term that was proportional to phi to the twelfth and so on and so forth, right? So you see what happened. As soon as we added an irrelevant operator, we were forced to add an infinite number of counter terms. We just continue this through all of the possible even powers of the polynomials, right? We need to add them all to absorb all of the divergences, and every time we add one, we have to go higher and higher to absorb all the divergences. Okay, so that's what goes wrong, right? We add, in this case, an irrelevant operator to our theory, and it spoils our normalizability because it forces us to add an infinite number of counter terms uh, and if we want to make some infinitely precise predictions, we're in trouble, right? We have to give up and go home. Does that make sense? I don't have any questions about this. This hopefully is familiar to you all from quantum field theory, but not everyone learns it in the same language uh, or really connects this notion of normalizability to the notion of uh, relevant marginal and irrelevant operators in a quantum field theory. So I just wanted to highlight this just so we're all on the same page. Okay. All right, so do we give up? If we have an irrelevant operator in our theory, if we have a non-renormalizable theory, do we give up and go home? Uh, that would be nice. I certainly haven't slept in about 48 hours, so I would really enjoy giving up and going home. Uh, but, uh, but we don't have to, right? So um, the magic of effective field theory is it allows us to systematically understand how we can live with quantum field theories uh, that have irrelevant operators in them. So again, let's just come back to our scalar example where um, we haven't yet forced ourselves to add this phi to the eight operator, so all we have are these terms we originally wrote down, the mass term, the quartic, and the sextic interaction. And we know, again, the sextic interaction, this is the irrelevant operator that causes us all sorts of problems. Okay, but if we look again at the coefficients of these terms, right, so the mass squared term, the quartic term, the sextic term, the sextic term, it scales like uh, its mass dimension, the coefficient is one over mass squared. Okay. Uh, so if we define the theory at some very high scale, again, some scale capital lambda where we write down the theory for the first time, then just by dimensional analysis, the natural size of that coefficient is one over lambda squared. Lambda is the only scale we have, uh, and so naturally speaking, the size of that coefficient should be one over lambda squared. All right. 
Well, then if we imagine taking the theory down to lower and lower energies, studying at longer and longer distances, so we're at energies that are much lower than the scale where we define the theory, uh, because the coefficient of this phi to the six operator, it's suppressed by one over lambda squared, the effects of that operator on all of the other physics, the physics given by the mass term and the quartic interactions, right, they're actually suppressed, and it's suppressed by e squared over lambda squared. Okay. So the effects of this irrelevant operator at much lower energies are suppressed by the energy at which you're probing the theory relative to the energy at which you define the theory to a, p a number of powers that depended on the mass dimension of this irrelevant operator. And if we went even higher, so if we added, for example, the phi to the eighth operator, right, that we know we need to absorb some divergence. So the coefficient of this thing would go like, it would have mass dimension, let's give it some coefficient, I think we called it rho. So the mass dimension of this coefficient is uh, one over mass to the fourth, and so its contributions to physics at low energies would be suppressed by energy over lambda to the fourth, and so on. And in fact, the suppression gets larger and larger, the more irrelevant we go in these possible operators. Okay. So that now gives us an operational notion. If what we really want in a physical theory is predictiveness, right, predictivity, if what we want to do is make some number of observations, then make a prediction with our theory for some new observation and see if it works out, if that's all we want to do, this starts to hint at how we can reconcile non-renormalizability uh, with making predictions and having a sensible theory. So the notion is, every time we make a prediction or every time we make a measurement, we do so with some sort of finite precision, right? We never make infinitely precise measurements. I know it probably seems sometimes like we're making very precise measurements of some things, but every measurement is finite in its precision, and every prediction is finite in its precision. You know, and if you look at uh, various measurements from the LHC, they all come with large error bars. Sometimes those error bars are even on the order of the central value of the measurement itself. So if we have some finite precision at which we want to make a prediction, right, and if we're wor working at some energy scale that's much lower than the energy scale at which we define the theory, we can afford to include a finite number of irrelevant operators and ignore any irrelevant operators at some higher order, right, as long as the contribution of those higher operators to various observables is smaller than the precision with which we're making measurements. Okay, in other words, you know, we can neglect an operator of phi to the n as long as the precision of a measurement we make is not any better than something that's of order e over lambda to the n. Okay. So that allows us, as long as we have a, 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 we're not infinitely ambitious, we stop at how precise we want to make a measurement, we can afford to write down a theory that has irrelevant operators in it, and we just by hand stop adding all of the other operators required but to absorb divergences. We can just stop adding all of those as long as we're willing to have some finite fixed amount of precision. Okay. Of course, this only works if we're studying the theory at energies that are much lower than the scale at which the theory is defined, right? As we start to go up to energies at which the theory is defined, then of course the suppression factor of E over lambda is becoming an order one number, and all of those irrelevant operators that we threw away, they're becoming increasingly important, and we have to bring them back because they're now making large contributions to all of our observables. Okay, so that's just the statement that then if we have an effective field theory with some irrelevant operators in it, we can afford to include only a finite number of those irrelevant operators and still make predictions as long as we're not trying to make predictions with precision greater than the energy at which we're probing the theory relative to the high scale at which the theory is defined to some power. And as we start to take the energies up to the scale at which the theory was defined, we'd better actually start including more and more of these irrelevant operators, or we'd better understand where the irrelevant operators are coming from. Okay. So this allows us to reconcile our notions of renormalizability and predictivity with the idea that we might, at some point, end up with a quantum field theory that has irrelevant operators. Okay. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, it's, uh, it, hopefully it's, it's part of everyone's education as a quantum field theorist these days, but you do find, especially in the language of quantum field theory, uh, as it's been phrased over the last 50 years, sometimes this little bit of extra understanding is, is missing. Okay. All right, so just to bring the picture together, all right, so what do we really mean by effective field theory then? So normally, uh, if we're understanding, if we're writing down any physical theory, what we normally specify is we specify the important degrees of freedom. So if we're studying quantum field theory, we specify the fields in the theory. Uh, and then we also generally specify the important symmetries, right? So again, if we're studying a quantum field theory, we're really specifying what are the interactions between the fields. And if we take these two things plus renormalizability, right, that gives us the standard model. 
That just amounts to specifying the field content, the forces of the standard model, and then writing down all of the interactions that are marginal and relevant, consistent with Lorentz invariance and uh, gauge invariance. All right. So we can go one step further into effective field theory by relaxing that requirement of renormalizability. Um, and to relax the requirement of renormalizability, we can still have predictivity as long as we specify some extra expansion parameters. So in a quantum field theory, that amounts to specifying some power counting, right? The power counting is just a notion uh, of some precision of measurement that you're going to make that allows you to justify cutting off effects that are subleading in some, criteria, in some quantity. Okay, so for example, in this theory that we wrote down, the scalar theory, the power counting is always, if we're studying the theory at some energy E, the power counting is in powers of the energy E over the scale lambda at which the theory was defined, and some number, right? So our power counting is in energy over some fundamental underlying scale. And once we specify the power counting, all right, then we can write down an effective field theory that includes non-normalizable operators, includes irrelevant operators, up to some order and power counting that corresponds to the precision of measurements we want to make. Okay, so that's generally, loosely speaking, what we mean by effective field theory. All right, so, you know, as a quantum field theorist, as an effective field theorist, you typically uh, encounter effective field theory in two different settings, right? So we uh, often encounter uh, effective field theory in the language of top-down effective field theory. These are effective field theories where uh, you have some low energy description that you want to write down that has some irrelevant operators in it. But you might also actually know some UV complete renormalizable theory at high energies uh, that gives you that low energy description. So a classic example, the one that I think most of us learn when we're first thinking about the standard model, um, <clears throat> is just the Fermi uh, effective theory that describes interactions of standard model fermions beneath the mass scale of the W and Z bosons. Right? So in that notion, there's a theory one, which is the standard model. But there's also an effective theory, let's call it a theory two, that's just this theory of four Fermi interactions, right? And of course, historically, we encountered the theory of four Fermi actions first, and then only later we understood that those irrelevant operators were actually generated by the exchange of W and Z bosons. But even knowing how that works, we still write down this hierarchy of effective field theories and the reason is that uh, even though we know what the complete theory is, if we want to do a calculation, of course, writing down the effective field theory is often much more efficient. So one reason for this is uh, there are radiative corrections to you know, various processes that are mediated by W and Z bosons. For example, there are QCD corrections to interactions between fermions that are mediated by W and Z bosons. Now, you'd be welcome to write down and calculate those corrections in your full theory of the standard model, but you would find that any time you did a calculation, it was subject to some very large logarithm that made your perturbation series poorly behaved. So what you do instead is you go to this much simpler description where you actually, instead of having the W and Z bosons, you just have irrelevant operators involving standard model fermions. And then you go ahead and you compute the effects of these QCD loops directly in the effective field theory, and that actually allows you to resum large logarithms from QCD very efficiently. So there are many examples where even if you actually know what the complete renormalizable theory is, we very often write down some low energy effective theory and do our calculations in terms of that low energy effective theory because it's a much more compact and efficient way of doing a calculation. Okay, so that's one context in which we encounter effective field theory. The other one, uh, which is the one that's more relevant actually to the standard model itself, is what we call a bottom-up effective field theory. So in a bottom-up effective field theory, you don't know what the UV theory is. You don't have a complete or normalizable theory uh, of all of the interactions. So all you have are some low energy degrees of freedom that you see at long distances. You don't know the underlying theory. So your rule here is just to write down all of the interactions that are consistent with the symmetries. You can't predict any of the couplings, so all you can do is make measurements in data and use it to fix some of the couplings, and then work at some order of power counting that allows you to justify so whatever number of irrelevant operators you want to include. So this, you know, most of the effective field theories that we actually think about as quantum field theorists fall into this category. So a good example is the chiral Lagrangian of QCD, right? That's the theory that describes the interactions of uh, mesons and baryons. So we know that in some essential way that should be related to the actual physics of QCD of quarks and gluons, but the physics of strong coupling is too complicated for us to map completely 
from the QCD description to the chiral Lagrangian. So in the chiral Lagrangian, we just specify the symmetries, uh, and then we write down all the interactions that are allowed by those symmetries. Okay. Uh, another good example is uh, quantizing Einstein gravity. So I know most of us, when we first started getting excited about physics, we're always told you know, that there's some irreducible incompatibility between gravity and quantum mechanics. Of course, in the language of effective field theory, that's not true at all. Right? The only problem is, if I want to write down a quantum field theory of Einstein gravity, it's necessarily a non-normalizable theory. But now we know we don't have to be scared about non-normalizable theories, right? as long as we have a well-defined power counting, as long as, for example, we're studying gravity at energies that are much lower than the Planck scale, we can write down a perfectly consistent non-normalizable quantum field theory of gravity, study the interactions of spin two particles in a quantum field theory, as long as we don't ask too many questions about what happens as we get close to the Planck scale. Okay. And finally, actually, uh, the final good example of a bottom-up effective field theory is actually the standard model itself. All right, so let me try to justify that statement, right? We started out by saying the standard model was defined by writing down the fields in the standard model and all of the interactions that were allowed by its symmetries. And now I'm going to tell you that, in fact, that was not a good idea and that we should actually think of the standard model as being an effective field theory that's defined from the bottom up and necessarily should contain irrelevant operators. Okay. So why am I making that strong claim that the standard model is just an effective field theory rather than some complete normalizable field theory? Well, there's really two reasons for it, right? Okay. So one of them is connected to the notion that we haven't included gravity in our description of the standard model. So gravity, we can write down some effective field theory for gravity, but that effective field theory uh, has infinite number of terms as we get close to the Planck scale. So we know something has to happen around the Planck scale to give us a complete theory of quantum gravity. And we expect that whatever happens at the scale of quantum gravity also takes the standard model along for the ride. Okay, so the standard model is a field theory, but we expect at energies close to the Planck scale, something happens, maybe it's string theory, maybe it's something else. Whatever it is, the field theory degrees of freedom in the standard model cease to become the relevant uh, variables for describing the theory, and they're caught up in whatever physics describes the complete theory of quantum gravity. You could actually ask yourself, it's a very useful question to ask yourself, um, is that actually necessarily uh, required? So is it possible maybe that uh, Einstein gravity, quantum gravity takes care of itself, it goes off and does its own thing, something happens to it that solves the non-normalizability of a quantum theory of gravity, and the standard model just stays as a good field theory up to arbitrarily high energies, okay? That would seem to be a perfectly reasonable assumption. We don't have a theory in detail for how that would work, uh, but maybe that's something that could happen. Um, it actually turns out, right, uh, that that can't work Okay, um, and the reason it can't work, you can see just by studying what happens to the couplings of the standard model as you go up to arbitrarily high energies. So um, I'll describe this in more detail in just one slide, but loosely speaking, right, we measure uh, the gauge couplings of QCD and the electroweak interactions. We measure them down at the Z pole. And then if the assumption is the quantum field theory at high and higher energies is just the standard model, then we can run those couplings up to higher and higher energies just using the beta functions for the gauge couplings. Uh, we can do it whatever loop order we wish to calculate. And so if you just take those couplings and you run them up, all right, if you run them up to arbitrarily high energies, what you see is actually the coupling that's the smallest down in the infrared, that's the smallest down at energies that we occupy, the gauge coupling of hypercharge, it actually blows up at some point. Okay, the point at which it blows up is 10 to the 42 GeV. All right, it's a scale that is vastly beyond uh, any of the scales and energies that we probe. Um, but that's a statement that if we just had the standard model on its own and we took it to arbitrarily high energies without involving it in some completion of quantum gravity, that the standard model itself would actually end up generating a pole and hypercharge at very high energies. Now, the physical interpretation of that uh, Landau pole is very interesting. So you can actually go on the lattice and you can ask what happens if you put the standard model um, into a setting where the hypercharge gauge coupling blows up at very high energies. And the answer is that actually the blow up of hypercharge gauge coupling causes all of the fermions in the standard model that are charged under hypercharge to make fermion condensates with non-zero expectation values. So it does in the ultraviolet an analogous version of what QCD does in the infrared. It makes a vacuum condensate of fermions. And that vacuum condensate of fermions, it would actually break electric symmetry and do a lot of other terrible things. So, the consistency of the theory, the fact that we see the standard model at low energies with unbroken symmetries, tells us that this is not actually what happens in nature. 
So something does have to come into the standard model to keep hypercharge from blowing up in the far ultraviolet. And the suggestion is probably what happens is whatever completes the theory of quantum gravity also cuts off the running of standard model gauge couplings and prevents us from ever having to deal with this. Okay, but it's a useful question to ask yourself, right? Does the completion of quantum gravity necessarily have to also cut off the standard model? Okay, the second piece of evidence we have that the standard model is an effective field theory is we just have incontrovertible evidence, right, full stop. There are additional fields and operators beyond the standard model that are not included in the standard model, and we know about them in nature, right? So those things that are not included in the standard model, those are things I'm not allowed to talk about in my lectures, but you've heard about in the other lectures at the summer school, right? So uh, does anyone want to tell me an example of an additional field or operator beyond the standard model that we know is there? You guys have been hearing about this all the last two weeks. Good, someone's talking. Related to neutrino masses, perfect. So the neutrino masses, uh, as hopefully you heard in your lectures on neutrinos, um, there are various possibilities. There could be additional light right-handed neutrinos that give us, have a Yukawa interaction that gives us neutrino mass. That would be an extra field. It's also possible without introducing new fields to just add an irrelevant operator to the standard model. This is the classic dimension five operator that gives Majorana neutrino masses. But that also counts, right? That's an extension of the standard model because it includes the first irrelevant operator you can add to the standard model. So that's incontrovertible evidence that there's physics beyond the standard model, right? We know there's physics beyond the standard model. And once you know that, right, then you should be open to the notion that there could be lots of interesting physics beyond the standard model because we've already seen something. Okay, uh, any other things that might, we might have incontrovertible evidence for? And by incontrovertible, I'm going to set aside um, uh, modifications of gravity explaining dark matter. So, <laughs> okay, all right. So, so the other thing that I would at least call incontrovertible evidence, I don't want to fight, I don't want to engage in arguments about primordial black holes, but we of course do have incredibly strong evidence for the existence of dark matter. And uh, as far as we're aware, right, dark matter is well described by some additional field or fields that are not, not included in the description of the standard model. Okay, so we know these things are there. Um, and that means we should really, these things together means we should think about the standard model as an effective field theory and not as a UV complete description on its own. Yeah? What's the difference between the story of the one and the other? There's no problem Of course, it has no problem at all, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a self-consistency, right? So, so what's, so let me, let me, here's this, this, Okay, so let's, here's a good slide to talk about it, right? Okay, so we take the standard model gauge couplings, right? SU3, SU2, and U1. We measure them at some scale. In this case, we make the most precise measurements at the z-pole. And then we again know we can run them up or down just using the beta functions in the standard model. So we can compute them in whatever loop we want, right? I'm lazy, so I mostly stick at one and two loops, but you know, you guys are powerful these days. You probably do six loop calculations. Um, all right, so we have the beta functions. They tell us how the couplings evolve as a function of scale. And at least at one loop, of course, uh, so you have the three gauge couplings, so I runs from one, two to three. You know at least at one loop or at whatever loop you care to calculate what the beta function coefficients are. And then, for example, you can ask in this case, if I measure the couplings, say, at the z-pole, then I can solve the uh, RGEs to find what the couplings are at some scale mu. In this case, the way I've written it, the scale mu is understood to be larger than the scale of the z, but of course you can flip it and also use it to study scales smaller. Okay, so now we see what happens as we run these couplings around. So here, I'm imagining we're measuring the couplings of the z-pole. Here's hypercharge, here's SU2, and here's QCD. So QCD, of course, as we go to lower and lower energies, we know it's asymptotically free. The coupling gets bigger and bigger and blows up. We get confinement. We spontaneously break some of the global symmetries of the fermions. Uh, we get our chiral Lagrangian. Everything is beautiful. We're not troubled by it at all. Okay. So now your question is great. So we have no problem with that. So now if I run the theory up into the ultraviolet, right, if I run it up into the ultraviolet, what happens? Well, SU2 and SU3 get smaller and smaller, but hypercharge gets bigger and bigger. Incidentally, hypercharge has no choice, right? Famously, before asymptotic freedom was understood, there was actually a proof by Tony Z uh, that if you just had theories of fermions, scalars, and abelian gauge bosons, that the gauge coupling of the abelian uh, gauge bosons could only ever increase as you went to the ultraviolet. Okay. So no matter, you can't add extra things to the standard model at high energies to fix this, it's always going to increase 
as you go to higher energies. So now your question is, there's no problem with QCD confining, so what's my problem with hypercharge confining? So normally the way we think about a quantum field theory, of course, is it's defined in the far ultraviolet, and then it's con there's just consequences of that as we go to the infrared. That's the sort of determinism that we use in thinking about quantum field theory. So what, the, what does this tell you? This tells you, well, hypercharge gets bigger and bigger and blows up. So now you can go ahead and you can study on the lattice what this does. And again, as I said, it creates non-zero fermion bilinear condensates, OK? But those non-zero fermion bilinear condensates, among other things, those actually spontaneously break electric symmetry. Okay. So what that would tell you, in fact, was that if there were a condensate from strong coupling of hypercharge at high energies, you would get fermion vacuum condensates that would break electric symmetry. And the order parameter for electric symmetry breaking would not be down at the weak scale where we see it. It would be up at 10 to the 42 GeV, and its natural size would be 10 to the 42 GeV. Okay. So it's a self-consistency argument, right? If this is what actually happens, we would never actually see electric symmetry down at low energies. Okay. So something, so consistency, the fact that we see electric gauge fields at low energies, tells us that something has to prevent this from happening. Okay. All right, so normally what do we think happens? Well, normally we assume either, look, right here, there's a suggestive point where the couplings run together. So that suggests gauge coupling unification. Gauge coupling unification famously fixes this problem because if we unify all the couplings into a non-abelian group, then that non-abelian group can become weakly coupled in the ultraviolet. So normally we assume that might happen, but of course that's physics beyond the standard model, right? And the other option is even if you know, the universe isn't kind enough to give us unification, maybe it just gives us quantum gravity at the Planck scale and that also just stops all the couplings from running because field theory is no longer a good description. Okay. All right. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you we should think of the standard model as an effective field theory even though when we write down the standard model, we specify it by just writing down we're normalizable operators. But the fact of the matter is, something is gonna happen at the scale of quantum gravity or thereabouts, and we already know there are things that are not included in the standard model. So the standard model we should think of as an effective field theory. All right, so then the game is, right, if that's the game, we know what the symmetries are, right? We know the gauge symmetries of the standard model. We know the field theory, field contents of the standard model. So what we should do is write down, like a good effective field theorist, all of the possible irrelevant operators we can write down in the standard model and establish a notion of power counting that allows us to decide when we start to care about these various operators. Okay, so we start at dimension five. Dimension five, these would be things where if all of the operators at different dimensions were suppressed by the same scale, dimension five would be the most important correction because it would be the least suppressed relative to the marginal and relevant operators in the standard model. So at dimension five, if we just, if we ignore flavor, so we consider one generation of the standard model at the time, there's just one operator we can write down. Famously, this is the operator that we can understand as giving us neutrino masses. Okay, so you might already think of the observation of non-zero neutrino masses as being evidence for the existence of this operator and also the value or the bounds we have on neutrino masses as being evidence for the scale. So dimension five, not that exciting. Uh, I'm assuming also that the operators I'm writing down actually respect some of the accidental symmetries of the standard model, which include baryon and lepton number. Uh, modulo violations by the existence of these terms. So now you can go to higher terms, you can go to dimension six. At dimension six, uh, you get many more operators. So the CP conserving and CP violating operators together give you 59 plus four operators. Again, just considering one generation of the standard model at a time. There are many different operators that can exist consistent with standard model gauge symmetries and Lorentz invariants at dimension six. There are operators that involve standard model gauge bosons or gauge bosons in conjunction with Higgs bosons. There are operators, like the operators we get in the Fermi effective theory that involve four fermions of the standard model. There are operators that purely involve the Higgses or the Higgses and their coupling to gauge fields. All right, so there's a whole zoo of operators and it gets even more complicated once we consider all the operators that are allowed by three different generations of the standard model. So the idea is if we think of the standard model as an effective field theory, we should imagine that all of these operators exist at some level in the theory with some unknown scale or coefficient in front of each of them. And so, generally speaking, the game is just to either identify non-zero coefficients by making measurements in nature, or at least, if we're not that lucky, to place bounds on them to bound the scale at which these operators appear. So you can ask, okay, that was dimension five and dimension six. You can ask what happens as you go through all of the different mass dimensions of possible irrelevant operators you could add to the standard model. Uh, this has been a little cottage industry over the last few years. People it's probably a sign that people are depressed about new physics at the LHC, that what they really want to do is count irrelevant operators. Um, 
So this is a nice plot by, uh, by Hitoshi Murayama and his group. They actually, this, the physics behind this is beautiful. They actually used conformal symmetry to organize the appearance of uh, irrelevant operators in the standard model. Um, so if you go through the mass dimension of possible operators, uh, here they've organized it. This is the number of irrelevant operators that appear for just one generation. This is if you include all three. Their counting is a little funny because the counting I just gave you um, is only counting completely Hermitian combinations of fields, but if you split them apart into uh, some irrelevant operator and its Hermitian conjugate, then of course you can increase the number of apparently independent operators. So by their counting, then there are two dimension five operators that are related by Hermitian conjugation. Those are the uh, neutrino mass operators. At uh, dimension six, if I have one generation, they get 84. Uh, and so on and so forth, and there's this little ladder that goes up and up. The reason why it oscillates back and forth, why there's more operators at even dimension rather than odd dimension, that more or less just has to do with the scaling dimensions of fields in the standard model and the requirements of gauge and Lorentz invariance. It just makes it easier to get even powers of mass dimension operators than odd. And then if you go to three generations, now of course there are many more combinatoric possibilities involving fields from different generations, so the number of operators goes up and up. So, you know, loosely speaking, right, um, physics beyond the standard model at this point could just amount to trying to find non-zero coefficients for some of these operators, or at least bounding them. And the way we would do that, of course, is just by looking at all possible data, all possible probes we have of the standard model, making as many possible predictions as we can, and making as many possible measurements that we can, and at a given order in power counting, that's enough to either constrain or discover evidence for various operators. Okay. So, you know, we get to draw data from over, thankfully, a fantastic range of energies. Uh, you've heard about probes that work on various parts of this line. This is as you go through different energy scales or length scales or time scales from the very longest distances, longest time scales, the very shortest distances and shortest time scales. There are lots of ways we can interrogate the standard model. There are lots of ways we can look for coefficients of these operators. Uh, but most of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my lectures is really looking at these coefficients uh, and looking at the standard model, looking for physics beyond the standard model right here around the GEV scale and the TEV scale. And it turns out, of course, that of all of these operators that we can use to extend the standard model, these irrelevant operators, most of them, the bounds that we've set on the operator coefficients are around the TEV scale. And that's just because the best way to probe the majority of these operators is just by smashing protons together and seeing what happens, right? There are some classes of operators that are better interrogated in other ways. So I think Andy has told you a lot about particular operators in the standard model that can be probed by uh, interesting measurements at the precision frontier. But most of the measurements, in particular the operators that can serve CP and baryon number and lepton number in the standard model, the best way to get at those is just to make the highest energy collider you can, smash protons together, and set bounds. Okay. So most of the bounds that we have on the standard model dimension six EFT are coming from measurements that we're making at a TEV scale. All right. Of course, if that were just our job, right, just to write down however many bajillion operators we're allowed to write down by symmetries and then constrain them by making lots of measurements, that wouldn't be very interesting. Um, so we, we also would like to have a strategy, right? We'd like to have a strategy to ask one, are there motivated classes of operators that we should think about? Are there particular operators that we think are important? And two, are there motivated energy scales, right? Are there actually scales at which we would, appear, we would expect these operators to appear that help to guide us in how we think about probing the standard model? Okay. So we have lots of different ways of guiding how we think about uh, looking for physics beyond the standard model. Each one of them is related to a problem or a shortcoming of the standard model. Um, so you've heard about a lot of these so far uh, during the summer school, so I just want to briefly blurb them. I organize them, loosely speaking, these are all things that would be extensions of the standard model that would have some scale of new physics associated with them. And uh, they're not all created equal, okay? So some of the things uh, I call, these are substantial uh, bits of physics beyond the standard model. These are things like dark matter or neutrino mass. By substantial, I mean they're things that we really have actual evidence that they exist, okay, right? So dark matter, we have very good evidence from concordance cosmology, from galactic rotation curves that dark matter exists. Uh, so it's pretty substantial that dark matter is out there. Similarly, neutrino masses, we have very firm evidence for neutrino masses. That's not included in the standard model. So those are substantial things that are beyond the standard model. We also have things where we don't have substantial evidence, but from the measurements we've made, we have very suggestive evidence. So we were just seeing that if you run the standard model gauge couplings up to higher and higher energies, they appear to cross at some point. All right, that gives a hint 
that there might be some unification of gauge couplings. So at least in the current data we have, we have a hint that there might be unification of standard model forces. We also see in nature, of course, there's an excess of baryons over antibaryons. Uh, that excess uh, is of a nature that would be very hard to get out randomly from uh, natural early conditions in the universe. So we also, at least, there's very suggestive evidence by the excess of baryons over antibaryons that there's some mechanism that generated the baryon asymmetry in the early universe. So that's also su suggestive evidence for that extension of the standard model. And then finally, we have the problems that actually we spend the most time thinking about uh, as people who do theory of physics beyond the standard model. The problems that we spend the most time thinking about are in some sense the most speculative because we don't have any evidence that these solutions to these problems exist. We have no evidence so far that solutions to these problems exist. The reason why we think they're problems and we try to solve them is because we see something in nature that is in tension with our theoretical expectations of how nature should behave. Now, you should always be scared or at least a little terrified whenever you're using that to justify something, right? Nature doesn't care what we think. Um, but in the, in the case of the strong CP problem, the cosmological constant problem, and the hierarchy problem, these are three problems where our theoretical expectations uh, for what the standard model should be doing are in conflict with what we see in nature. We see that as a problem and we try to solve it. So there are lots of reasons why we think there should be physics beyond the standard model. These various reasons for thinking there's physics beyond the standard model, they don't all necessarily have to live at the same energy scale. So the other thing I've tried to plot here is you can ask as a function of energy scale where the new physics associated with each of these things might show up. Okay, so famously dark matter, the actual the mass of the dark matter could range over 80 orders of magnitude. So dark matter could be as light, uh, the lightest dark matter could be is a scalar whose Compton wavelength is the size of a galaxy, right? If it were any larger, then of course we wouldn't be able to form structure that we see. So that sets a lower bound on the mass of dark matter, but that's way down here. The upper bound coming from machos is way up here, right? So dark matter ranges over many orders of magnitude. Neutrino mass, the physics associated with neutrino mass could come over many orders of magnitude. Unification is suggestive at very high energies, but there could be evidence at lower energies. The baryon asymmetry could be explained over a very large range of energies. The strong CP problem, uh, you've also heard again about the axion solution to the strong CP problem, but it turns out solutions to the strong CP problem could also range over a vast range of energies. The cosmological constant problem, um, I don't even know how to classify the energy ranges over which solutions might live because we don't actually have a lot of good solutions, so I'm gonna leave that one open. Uh, and then finally, the hierarchy problem, which is going to be the subject of most of the rest of my lectures, the hierarchy problem really lives down close to the TeV scale. The scale of the hierarchy problem is really set by the scale of the Higgs vacuum expectation value, and so any solution to the hierarchy problem also has to live around that energy scale. Okay. All right, so I've been asked to talk about uh, physics beyond the standard model at the TV scale, so that gives us a slice in energies that's right around here. Um, and so that's why for at least the, next, the rest of this lecture uh, and next lecture, I'm gonna focus a lot on the hierarchy problem. Uh, and then as we wrap out my lectures, I'm gonna talk, stretch a little bit up here, talk also about the strong CP problem, baryogenesis, and gauge coupling unification as it might appear at the TV scale. Okay. All right, before we move on, does anyone have any questions? Warm afternoon, everyone's feeling a little sleepy, you had a nice lunch, right? Okay, all right. So let's get on to the hierarchy problem, and my goal here is primarily to convince you that the hierarchy problem exists. And that's because I think it becomes popular these days, if you don't think about the hierarchy problem that carefully, to think that the hierarchy problem is some fantasy and that people who think about the hierarchy problem are just deluded. Now, you might conclude by the end of my lectures that I am just deluded, but hopefully it won't be because you think the hierarchy problem is vacuous. Okay. So to understand what the hierarchy problem is, right, the electroweak hierarchy problem, uh, first we need to understand a little bit about our expectations for the size of quantities in a quantum field theory. Okay. So our expectations for the size of quantities in a quantum field theory, uh, loosely speaking, these are things that we call natural values of parameters. And so uh, these criteria that we impose on the size of parameters in quantum field theory are things we call naturalness criteria. So the first naturalness criteria goes back to Dirac, all right? It's the sort of simplest thing you would imagine. So Dirac posited, you know, if you have a theory with some fundamental scale, capital lambda, 
then you have a natural size for every operator coefficient in your quantum field theory, right? You've added the fields, you can write down all the possible interactions, and you want to ask what is the size of every interaction? Uh, and Dirac tells you there's a natural expectation for what that should be. So every, the size of every operator coefficient should be some order one dimensionless number times the fundamental scale appearing with however many powers it has to to make up the mass dimensions of the operator. So in the example of our scalar field theory, right, the mass term had mass dimension mass squared, so it would appear with lambda to the fourth. The quartic term, uh, the coefficient had mass dimension zero, so it would appear with no powers of lambda but with an order one coefficient. The phi to the sixth appeared as one over mass to the, uh, one over mass squared was the coefficient, so that would go like one over lambda squared, okay. So Dirac naturalness is just the expectation all dimensionless numbers are one, all dimensionful parameters are the defining scale of your theory. Uh, and the reason for this is pretty simple, right? Any quantum field theory, any interacting quantum field theory, uh, quantum effects connect all possible interactions in all possible ways, unless there's some special selection rules. So at the end of the day, everything is going to come out to be more or less the same value in its appropriate units. And this is what gives us this naturalness criterion. Now, Hutuft led us to a slightly more refined, or depending on how you think about it, a slightly more weaselly notion of naturalness. Hutuft pointed out, you know, there are ideas of selection rules, right? We see selection rules all the time in quantum mechanics. Um, and so selection rules should tell us quantum effects don't connect everything together. There might be some things that are protected from quantum effects, and those would be at least we'd be justified in setting them aside and uh, justifying their natural size as being different from the natural size of everything else. Okay, so in detail, all right, what Hattuf told us was that coefficients of operators can be much smaller than the Dirac natural value if, when we take the coefficient to zero, the theory has an enhanced symmetry, okay? Uh, so in particular, if there's some operator where taking the coefficients of the operator to zero gives us a larger symmetry of the theory, then the natural size of that operator is the Dirac natural value times some parameter that can be less than one, that can be small, and that parameter we can think of as the parameter that violates this enhanced symmetry. So the reason for this, this thinking is pretty clear, right? Let's imagine I never had this operator, the operator was zero, so my theory had some enlarged symmetry. Okay, so if that enlarged symmetry was a perfectly good symmetry of my theory, then quantum effects would respect it, all right? Assuming it wasn't an anomalous symmetry, quantum effects would respect it, and that means no renormalization effects would generate an operator that violated the symmetry. Okay, so everything would just be uniformly, this operator would stay uniformly zero even after quantum effects are taken into account. Now if I can imagine breaking that symmetry by a very small amount, okay? Now of course quantum corrections can, uh, so now the symmetry is no longer an exact symmetry of the theory, quantum corrections no longer have to respect the exact symmetry. But they had better be proportional, the quantum corrections that violate the symmetry, they'd still better be proportional to the amount by which I broke the symmetry, right? Because that's necessary for me to smoothly interpolate between the limit where the symmetry is exact and perfectly respected by quantum corrections and where it's inexact and violated by quantum corrections. For that to be smooth behavior uh, interpolating between those two limits, quantum corrections had better be proportional to the violation of the symmetry. So that justifies the appearance of this term, right? This is the amount by which I violate the symmetry. And if it's small, that tells me I can have some coefficients that are smaller than others. And those coefficients are the ones where if I took them to zero, there would be a larger symmetry in my theory. Okay, so that's the notion of technical naturalness. All right, so we have these two notions of naturalness. And then we go out in our quantum field theories of nature, in particular in the standard model, and we ask how good these are as guidelines to, uh, to the values of parameters we see in the standard model. So the first place we can go to look to ask if this notion of naturalness is a good idea is actually where Dirac looked. Okay, the, the reason Dirac came up with this notion in the first place and had a problem with it was he saw the mass of the proton down at a GeV. He also knew there was some mass scale associated with quantum gravity, some around 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 GeV. And he wanted to know, right, his notion of naturalness said that these scales could not be different from each other, but they were different by many, many orders of magnitude. So Dirac was just asking why is the proton so much lighter than the Planck scale. Okay. Uh, so in Dirac's time, that was a puzzle. We now know, of course, it's not a puzzle at all. It's actually a beautiful consistency of a quantum field theory. So the lightness of the proton with respect to the Planck scale is a perfect example of Dirac naturalness, but you needed the right uh, degrees of freedom, right? So we know the proton now, of course, is not an elementary field. Uh, the proton is just a bound state of quarks uh, from the confinement of QCD. And so we can understand the hierarchy between the proton mass and the Planck scale in terms of Dirac naturalness as follows. 
right? We again, we have the beta functions of the standard model. Uh, they give us, they tell us if we measure the couplings at some scale, we can then evolve them to other scales just by renormalization group evolution. So in particular, if we imagined uh, the QCD coupling is being given to us at the Planck scale where the theory was defined, right, then we could compute the QCD coupling at any lower scales just by solving the beta functions. And at least at one loop, right, we can figure out the, the QCD coupling at a lower scale just from the one loop solution to the renormalization group equations. Okay. So if we take this, of course, the way that this works, the sign of the QCD beta function coefficient is such that given a finite value of the QCD coupling at some scale, it just gets larger and larger as we go to longer and longer distances into the far infrared. So that means in principle, at some point then, of course, it blows up. And we, in fact, know this happens in nature. This is confinement of QCD. So we can go ahead and ask, where does that scale happen, right? So that scale happens where the QCD coupling, loosely speaking, goes to infinity, or one over the QCD coupling goes to zero. So we can use that to define a scale that we call the QCD confinement scale. Okay, so that's just what we mean by the scale, right? That would be whatever scale at which this term goes to zero. So then we can go ahead and we can actually solve for where that scale is just by looking at this equation, right? So the scale at which one over the QCD coupling goes to zero, all right, is the scale that is the Planck scale, right, where we started out defining our theory, times an exponential, and the exponential goes like there's factors of 2 pi, there's a beta function coefficient, and there's 1 over the gauge coupling of the Planck scale. But this is very interesting, right? We see we started out with one scale, the Planck scale, and now we get another scale that is exponentially different from the Planck scale, and it's exponentially different because the gauge coupling runs logarithmically. Okay. So this is the well-understood phenomenon of dimensional transmutation. Uh, it's the notion by which if you start out with one scale, you can get an exponentially different scale just due to the logarithmic running of gauge couplings. All right. Now, of course, we know the proton is just a bound state of confinement of QCD. So to first order, at least, the mass of the proton is the confinement scale of QCD. And that now answers Dirac's question, right? It tells us if the theory of the standard model was defined up at the Planck scale, so the only dimensionful scale was the Planck mass, but the proton doesn't exist up at the Planck scale. The, the dimensionless couplings, for example, are the standard model gauge couplings. If they're order one up at the Planck scale, then we just run them down to lower and lower energies. We find that QCD blows up, and it gives us a new mass scale that's exponentially different from the Planck scale. So this perfectly satisfies Dirac's criterion of naturalness. When the theory was defined, all of the scales were the Planck scale, all of the couplings were order one, and then the phenomenon of dimensional transmutation gave us a bound state, the proton, that was exponentially lighter than the Planck scale. Okay, so Dirac didn't know it, but this was beautiful validation of his picture. All right, so score one for naturalness. Yeah. Of course, there's another big hierarchy when we look at the standard model, and this is another one um, I think that Yossi talked about a fair bit uh, during his lectures. Uh, which are the flavor hierarchies, right? We look at the fermion masses in the standard model, or equivalently, we look at the Yukawa couplings, and we also see a large range of numbers, right? We see, you know, the electron is about 10, excuse me, about five orders of magnitude lighter than the top quark. If we imagine that uh, the neutrinos get their masses from a Dirac-like coupling, then of course the Yukawa associated with the neutrinos is something like 11 orders of magnitude lighter, smaller than that of the top quark. Um, so, you know, this seems to be a violation of Dirac naturalness, right? We have dimensionless couplings in the standard model, the Yukawa couplings that range over somewhere between 5 and 11 orders of magnitude. Okay, so that, that seems bad for Dirac. Uh, but thankfully, Hattuft comes in and tells us it's okay, right? While there might be a large numerical hierarchy in these couplings, it's technically natural. Okay. And the reason it's technically natural, I think, as Yossi emphasized in his lectures, is if you took all of the standard model Yukawa couplings to zero, Right? There's an enhanced symmetry of the standard model. It's the symmetry under which you can do flavor rotations of all of the different fields. Okay, so in particular, there's a nice decomposition where you can think of it as we have three different generations. So there's an SU3 symmetry of rotating all of the left-handed quark doublets into each other, and there's an SU3 symmetry for every other type of left-handed vial fermion in the standard model, right? So there's five different SU3 symmetries, and then we can break off five different U1 global symmetries that we can or think of as baryon number, lepton number, hypercharge, a peche quin symmetry, and a free extra rotation of right-handed uh, electrons. All right, so there's, if we turn off the Yukawa couplings of the standard model, we get this giant U3 to the fifth flavor symmetry. And so, and we can think of turning on the Yukawa couplings of the standard model, we can think of these as being, the Yukawas as actually being spurions, that is to say, we can think of them as being uh, parameters 
whose uh, values violate the symmetries, but by a small amount, they give us selection rules that tell us how radiative corrections have to preserve or violate the symmetry. Okay, so we think of the Yukawa couplings, turning them onto non-zero values as being parameters that violate this large symmetry. And so from Dirac's, excuse me, from Hutuft's notion of technical naturalness, it's at least plausible to understand why some Yukawa couplings might be different from others, right? That um, because when we turn the Yukawa couplings off, there's an enhanced symmetry of the theory, radiative corrections should be proportional to violations of the symmetry, and therefore the Yukawa couplings we can think of as being technically natural parameters. All right. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that we feel perfectly happy about them. So as people who would like to understand nature, we would still like to understand where these hierarchies come from, why there are five orders of magnitude, uh, for example, in the fermion masses. But uh, that's a separate question, right? If someone gave you a theory for these five orders of magnitude, you at least would understand why radiative corrections didn't spoil it, because these parameters are technically natural. All right. So here's two nice examples of naturalness in nature. One, the notion of Dirac naturalness, which we actually can think of as explaining why the proton is so much lighter than the Planck scale. And the second notion of Hutuf technical naturalness, which we see is justifying the large numerical hierarchies that we see in the Yukawa couplings. Okay. So, so far, naturalness looks like a good argument for explaining the values of parameters that we see in the standard model. So then we go to the Higgs, right? So we go to the Higgs, and uh, we apply the same arguments of naturalness. So the notion of Dirac naturalness tells us uh, the scaling dimension of the Higgs mass. Of course, uh, that has uh, dimensions of mass squared. And so the notion of Dirac naturalness would tell us that the mass squared of the Higgs in the standard model should be an order one number times whatever fundamental scale at which the standard model was defined. Okay, so that could be the Planck scale, that could be some other scale well above the weak scale, but whatever that is, right, that value seems to be vastly different from the value of the Higgs mass that we see in nature, and that is the essential uh, nature of the hierarchy problem. Why is the Higgs mass uh, so much smaller than, for example, the apparent scale of quantum gravity? Now, when you first hear about the hierarchy problem, you usually hear about it in the following way. Somebody writes down something that they call a quadratic divergence, right? They say, oh, I've got the standard model, right? I've got the standard model. I've got the Higgs. Let me compute a radiative correction to the Higgs mass. So I've got a one loop diagram, for example, that corrects the Higgs mass that comes, say, from top quarks running in a loop, right? Or uh, maybe I have a one loop diagram coming from W and Z bosons running in a loop. I compute those diagrams, right? I integrate them up to some hard momentum cutoff lambda. I get a quadratic divergence, right? So the Higgs mass gets a quadratically divergent correction that's proportional to the cutoff squared. And then it has some coefficients that depend on the various standard model particles that run in the loops, right? So how many people were first told that this is the hierarchy problem? That the hierarchy problem is a problem with quadratic divergences, right? Okay, I was, certainly, all right, right, okay. But that's confusing, right? If you think about it, way before you learned about the Higgs boson or the standard model, you learned that computing a loop diagram and getting an infinity is nothing to be terrified of in a quantum field theory, right? We know how to renormalize quantum field theories. We get an infinity, that's fine. We parameterize it with some regularization procedure. And then we use a renormalization procedure to absorb the infinities and to remove them so that we can relate physical quantities to physical quantities, right? So just computing a loop diagram with some hard cutoff and getting some quadratic divergence, that's not obvious that this is a problem, right? It, according to our normal prescription of renormalization, that's just an infinite term that we have to absorb into a counter term and shift around, but it's not obvious that it's an actual problem. And you might think, look, if the problem is a quadratic divergence, right, isn't my problem just that I chose a bad way to parameterize my infinities? What if I chose dimensional regularization with minimal subtraction, right? There, what I would do is I would do this loop integral in D minus epsilon, in, you know, uh, instead of D dimensions or four dimensions, I would do it in four minus epsilon dimensions, right? I would deform the space-time dimension to regularize infinities. And that would allow me to parameterize my infinities by the dimensionality of space-time rather than by quadratic divergence. So I would never obviously see the existence of some large quadratic divergence in dimensional regularization, right? So how many people had the second thought, right? Someone told them the problem was quadratic divergences and they thought, that, hey, wait. Don't I just know how to handle divergences? Okay, right? I certainly had that thought. Okay, so now, now it seems like there's some sort of interesting confusion, right? Okay? Yeah. 
No, this, this, so if we write down the standard model, so if we write down the standard model as a, as a so if we ignore neutrino masses, okay, we could just write down the standard model as a, a renormalizable theory where all the interactions in the standard model are themselves renormalizable, right? So if we start with renormalizable operators, I don't have to add irrelevant operators, right? I can absorb all of the divergences in a finite number of counterterms. So if I just have the standard model with the Higgs, I can absorb all these divergences with a finite number of counterterms, okay? okay. So now there's a, fun, there's a fun tension, and I think this is where people get confused about the existence of the hierarchy problem, because they say, look, my advisor or some other well-meaning person said it was a problem with quadratic divergences. I understand quadratic divergences are not actually a problem in a quantum field theory. They're just a sign that I have to do some renormalization. Uh, and so then there's confusion about whether this is a real problem. So of course, the answer is the quadratic divergence is not the actual problem, right? The hierarchy problem is not the existence of quadratic divergences. The quadratic divergences are a sign that there's a problem, but you have to think at least a little bit more carefully about what the problem actually is. Okay, so let's now get into that. Okay. The one thing the quadratic divergence is telling you is that the Higgs mass is not special. Okay, I know we're all special snowflakes. The Higgs mass is not special. Okay, um, that is to say, uh, it's not a technically natural parameter. So if I take the Higgs mass to zero in the standard model, there's no enhanced symmetry, okay? That's particularly interesting because it's unlike the other mass parameters that might appear in the standard model or in any other quantum field theory, for example, involving fermions or gauge bosons. For example, if I have a fermion, say some Dirac fermion with some mass, I can make that mass much smaller than the fundamental scale of my theory in a technically natural way, because if I take that mass parameter to zero, there's an enhanced symmetry of the theory, right? If I take the mass of a Dirac fermion to zero, there's a chiral symmetry under which I do chiral rotations of the Dirac fermion. Okay, so, and if I turn on the mass term, of course, that breaks those chiral symmetries. All I'm left with is the single vector-like symmetry. So from the notion of technical naturalness, we can understand it should be possible, it should be acceptable in a field theory to have a fermion mass that's much smaller than the fundamental scale of the theory, because when I take the mass to zero, there's an enhanced symmetry. So it's technically natural, okay. Same thing applies for spin one degrees of freedom for gauge fields, right? So if I have a theory of a massive gauge degree of freedom, if I don't worry too much about what's happening in the UV, of course, if I take the mass parameter of that gauge field to zero, there's manifest linearly realized gauge invariance of that gauge degree of freedom. So again, sort of by the notions of technical naturalness, here the argument is a little less precise, but because there's an enhanced fully linearly realized symmetry when I take the mass of the gauge field to zero, I can also think of the mass parameter spin one fields as being small. Yes? So in the definition of technical naturalness, you had to say the parameter you took to zero was dimensionless. Here it's a mass. Does this change the parameter? You can just absorb dimensionless in some? No, you, you can absorb, yeah. So, so here, well here you could think of these parameters as being given, yeah. Right, so, so there I think the, the precise answer is that um, my definition of technical, my example of technical naturalness was not supremely precise. Here, the appropriate thing to think of, here the appropriate thing to think of is that the mass parameter itself is much smaller than the fundamental scale. But you could also have examples where the mass parameter was the fundamental scale times a small dimensionless parameter. Okay. But as far as these examples are concerned, chiral symmetry and gauge symmetry, it's purely an argument that you can think of as relating to the size of the mass parameter itself. Okay. So now you can understand it's possible to have technically natural mass parameters for a spin one half particle and a spin one particle. And so you can ask yourself, uh, what happens if I take the mass parameter of a, of a scalar, in particular if I take the mass parameter of a Higgs boson to zero in the standard model, and there's no enhanced symmetry when I do that, all right? So the Higgs mass uniquely, the Higgs mass parameter, is an invariant of all of the preserved symmetries of the standard model. And so if I take it to zero, then of course there's no new symmetry that emerges. All right. So this mass parameter is not technically natural, and we're unable to understand its smallness relative to a fundamental scale. Yes? So um, at the classical level, you get scale invariance, yes. So in particular, you'll notice I was careful to say the mass of a scalar in the context of the standard model, right? So the standard model, of course, has various other marginal parameters, for example, the Yukawa couplings and the gauge couplings. And in quantum mechanical theory, those, of course, um, violate the shift symmetries or the scale invariance that you would have at the classical level. So classical scale invariance is not a useful or functioning guiding symmetry of the standard model. 
In the same way that we don't use anomalous global symmetries to expect the existence of light goldstone bosons in the chiral Lagrangian, we don't use things that are not actually symmetries of the quantum theory to control the quantum properties of the theory. So in the standard model, because there are parameters that violate classical scale invariance, when I take the Higgs mass to zero, while classically you might say there is a scale invariance of the theory that becomes manifest, quantum mechanically that's not true. And so that's why the answer is none. Okay. All right. So this is part of the way there, right? The quadratic, the existence of a quadratic divergence is just related to the fact that there's no manifest enhanced symmetry uh, that arises in the standard model as I take the Higgs mass parameter to zero. And so I do expect if the theory is defined at some fundamental scale, there's no reason for that mass to be much smaller than that scale. So if you look at this, at this quadratic divergence, there's really, what this is actually telling you, there's sort of two different levels of hierarchy problem that it's signaling, okay? Um, and I like to call these the strong form of the hierarchy problem and the weak form of the hierarchy problem. I happen to believe in both forms of the hierarchy problem. At the very least, hopefully I can convince you by the end of these lectures that you should believe in at least one of them. So the strong form of the hierarchy problem really dates back to the original Wilsonian conception of a quantum field theory, where, you know, Wilson, I mean, as a condensed matter theorist, if you see a divergence in a, in a condensed matter system and you regularize it with some cutoff scale, you actually believe that that cutoff scale is physical, right? That cutoff scale is, for example, the size of some lattice or the size of some, uh, some fundamental degrees of freedom in your effective description. <clears throat> and so from that perspective, actually, all apparent divergences in a quantum field theory um, are actual real things, and cutoffs are actual real terminations of, uh, or real cutoffs to the actual momentum behavior in loops. Okay. So, the strong form of the hierarchy problem is the notion that whatever your fundamental description is, your fundamental description should be finite, all quantities should be calculable, and any time you get something like a quadratic divergence, what it's really signaling is actually some physical sensitivity to whatever is making the theory finite. Okay. In the standard model, we don't actually, we, it, it's hard to know exactly what the strong form of the hierarchy problem means because in the standard model itself, right, not all quantities are finite. So in particular, the fact that the Higgs mass has a quadratic divergence, uh, nothing controls the size of that quadratic divergence, nothing tells us, allows us to predict the Higgs mass parameter in the standard model. So we don't know exactly what to make of this, but anytime you extend the standard model to make the Higgs mass parameter a calculable quantity, something that you could predict in terms of other fundamental parameters, you see that it in fact, um, the existence of a quadratic divergence, what it tells you in a finite theory is that the Higgs is getting contributions from whatever mass scale is set by the fundamental degrees of freedom. So we'll see examples of this in the remaining lectures. In particular, um, anytime you, for example, extend the standard model with supersymmetry or a global symmetry, both of which render the Higgs mass finite in a well-defined way, you see that there are meaningful contributions to the Higgs mass of this size. Okay. So that's the strong form of the hierarchy problem. The fundamental theory should be finite. Something like a cutoff is really uh, corresponding to some actual physical scale. It could be a lattice spacing or a discretization of space time. And so the existence of a quadratic divergence tells you really that there are finite contributions from whatever physics is rendering the Higgs mass finite itself. But even if you don't believe in the strong form of the hierarchy problem, there's also a weak form of the hierarchy problem. So the weak form of the hierarchy problem says, look, I don't know what happens in the far ultraviolet of the standard model. I don't know if we have a string theory or a space-time lattice. I have no idea. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to do what I learned how to do when I first learned quantum field theory, which is only talk about observable quantities, things like pole masses, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make measurements and I'm going to relate them at different scales and I'm going to absorb all of my divergences into counter terms, okay? And I'm only going to talk about finite quantities, all right? But the point is, if you only talk about finite quantities, if you only talk about things like pole masses and you discard all divergences, you don't attribute any physical significance to them, the point here is every time I have an additional physical mass scale that's above the weak scale, so any time I have any additional degrees of freedom, any additional massive particles that talk to the Higgs, forget the divergences, those massive particles, if they talk to the Higgs, they give the Higgs mass a finite contribution that you can calculate that's independent of how you parameterize your divergence. And all of those finite contributions are also large and important and also tell you that the Higgs mass is somehow unnaturally small. So hopefully it's clear, and by looking at some examples, I'll try to make this more clear. The strong form of the hierarchy problem is 
The fundamental theory should be finite. The quadratic divergence is just a sign that whatever makes the theory finite is gonna contribute something to the Higgs mass of this size. The weak form of the hierarchy problem says, I'm not gonna worry about interpretation of divergences. I'm not gonna worry about making my theory finite. But every time I have a new physical particle with a physical mass scale, it's going to give me a physical calculable contribution to the Higgs mass that will be finite, whose size will be given by the mass of the new particles. Okay. So we'll get to realizations of the strong form of the hierarchy problem uh, in the next few lectures. But the next thing I just want to convince you of is, even if you only believe in the weak form of the hierarchy problem, namely, the only things I'm going to worry about are finite calculable contributions to the Higgs mass coming from the masses of new particles, that even the weak form of the hierarchy problem is, is a big deal. Okay. So I've got about five more minutes to this uh, first lecture, so I just want to start with a very simple toy model to understand this weak form of the hierarchy problem. Um, and the simple toy model, let's just imagine writing down a theory with a single real scalar and a Dirac fermion. Okay, so we can write down a kinetic term for the real scalar, we can write down a kinetic term for the Dirac fermion. Let's imagine we write down, for example, a mass term for the scalar. We could turn on a self-interaction. We write down a mass term for the fermion. And let's write a coupling between them, a Yukawa type coupling that couples to the scalar to the fermion. Okay, so now we wanna ask ourselves the question. Can we arrange in, for a theory to be such that the scalar is much, much lighter than the fermion? In other words, can we make this mass parameter, the mass of the scalar, to be much, much smaller than the mass of the fermion? So this says nothing about you know, quadratic divergences or the finiteness of the theory or any of that stuff. I just have a mass of the scalar, a mass of the fermion, and I want to know in a quantum theory, can I make these two scales very well separated? Okay. So, if I do that, one thing I can do as an effective field theorist, right, if I make the fermion very heavy at some mass scale big M, I make the scalar light at some mass scale little m, as an effective field theorist, what I should do is I should think of, at short distances, I have a theory of both a scalar and a fermion, but beneath the mass scale of the fermion, I can integrate it out, and I really just have an effective field theory given by this light scalar degree of freedom. So I can go ahead and I can study the effective field theory of this light scalar degree of freedom, which is the quantum field theory that's relevant for all of these energies between the two mass scales. Okay. So to do that, what I would do is I would start with my fundamental theory that I defined at short distances, and I would integrate out the massive fermion at the scale capital M, and I would come up with an effective field theory at lower scales of just the light fermion, excuse me, just the light scalar. So this is an example of a top-down EFT, right? I have the fundamental theory, the fundamental parameters, I match to a lower energy description that just involves the scalar. So I can ask, what are the natural values of the parameters in that effective field theory? Okay, so I can do this in lots of different ways. So what do I do? Okay, so I have my original theory, my original theory has a scalar and a fermion. And so at one loop, for example, I can calculate, I've got the bare parameters in my theory. I have the mass of the scalar and the mass of the fermion. And then I can calculate one loop corrections, for example, coming from a loop of the fermion correcting the mass of the scalar. All right. So those, the sums of those contributions will give me the mass of the scalar degree of freedom at low energies. So I can do those loop calculations however I want. I can do the loop calculation, for example, um, with a hard momentum cutoff. And so if I do the loop calculation, again, this is just a loop calculation. I want to ask, in my effective field theory, what is the mass of my scalar? In terms of my original theory, it's given by whatever the mass of the scalar was in my UV theory, plus, for example, various quantum corrections that come from loops of the fermions, okay? So that's what I'm calculating here on the right-hand side. So I could do this calculation, for example, with a hard momentum cutoff, and I get a quadratic divergence. Ooh, right? Scary quadratic divergences. I could also say, okay, quadratic divergences don't impress me. Let me do the same calculation of that loop in dimensional regularization, right? So I just deform space-time by some small amount. Um, so then, of course, instead of getting quadratic divergence, I get a one over epsilon pole. All right. Uh, so in both cases, there's some divergence. I can parameterize it in different ways. But crucially, right, these are, this is just how I'm parameterizing the divergence. Of course, then I know actually in renormalized perturbation theory, I can actually just express things in terms of the, the renormalized parameters defined at some scale. And so, for example, if I just ask what are the, these relations in terms of the renormalized parameters, say at the mass scale where I match from my UV theory with the fermion and the scalar to the low energy theory that just contains the scalar, okay? In both cases, the low energy theory of the scalar, the mass of that scalar is whatever its mass was at the matching scale, plus 
Now, so that's in terms of a normalized parameter. I've absorbed the divergences into my counter terms. And all that's left behind in either of these cases is some finite quantity. And it's the finite quantity is the same in both cases. So the finite quantity is a contribution proportional to the fermion mass squared, which I get in both cases, and I get with the same coefficient. Okay. So what that is saying is in a normalized perturbation theory, right, all of the divergences are absorbed into counter terms. Those disappear. I don't see them. There's nothing terrifying about quadratic divergences. But instead, there's a finite and calculable correction coming from the mass of the fermion, right? This is a threshold correction. It's a threshold correction that I pick up when I go from the full theory to the low energy effective theory of just the scalar. So it tells me my low energy theory of the mass of the scalar is related to the normalized mass of the scalar in the high energy theory plus a finite threshold correction that's just a loop factor down on the mass of the fermion. Okay. So now you see there's a weak form of the hierarchy problem, right? I've gotten rid of all my divergences. I'm not worrying about any of the infinities. But I can't make the fermion arbitrarily heavier than the scalar without some degree of fine tuning, right? The mass of the scalar that I see at low energies is whatever its renormalized mass was at high energies, plus this threshold correction coming from the fermion that's proportional to the fermion mass. So if I wanted to make the scalar arbitrarily light with respect to the fermion mass, I would have to cancel this finite threshold correction proportional to the fermion mass against whatever the renormalized mass of the scalar was in my UV theory, right? So that would require these terms to cancel against each other. And the precision of the cancellation or the amount of tuning I need is precisely proportional to how much lighter I want to make the scalar than the fermion up to a loop factor, okay? So hopefully this has convinced you there's a real problem here. It has nothing to do with quadratic divergences, right? It has to do with the fact that if I have a physical mass scale from a heavy fermion and it's talking to a scalar, the scalar mass gets pulled up to that fermion mass within a loop factor. And if I want to make them very different, that requires some fine tuning between my renormalized parameters of my UV theory and this threshold correction. Okay? So nothing scary about quadratic divergences, just a finite correction. Yes? What's that? Uh, oh, this is the, let's see. Uh, yes, probably, well, it depends. Yes, one of the fractions should be swapped. Yeah, so this should go up here, right? I apologize for my airplane dyslexia. All right. OK. So in particular, right, this tells you there's actually a useful way to think about the quadratic divergence, right? So if I just taken the theory of the scalar talking to the fermion and calculated the quadratic divergence, right, with a hard momentum cutoff like I did up here, I saw I got a quadratic divergence, all right? The quadratic divergence isn't the actual thing to worry about, right? That's not a problem at all in my normalized theory. But what is a problem is the finite correction coming from the physical mass threshold of the fermion. Okay. So the quadratic divergence, anytime you see a quadratic divergence, it's useful as a placeholder. It's a stand-in. It says, if there were some other physics with a physical mass scale, I don't, I'm not going to specify exactly what it is, but if it did exist in the ultraviolet of my theory, it would give a finite and calculable correction to the Higgs mass. All right? And so the quadratic divergence is just a stand-in. It's just a stand-in for unspecified, finite, calculable new physics. All right. And in this case, right, we can see the quadratic divergence, you know, it's just a signal that there's actually a finite contribution, in this case, that comes from a fermion mass. Okay, so, oh, yes? This is not a question, but um, so in order to get rid of that divergence, you needed to add a counter term. Yes. Can you just reabsorb the term in large M squared? Also so so you, you can, so it's, it, it, okay. We can get into the systematics of this normalization. So yeah, so you always, whatever you do, you define how you regularize your infinity and then your normalization scheme, which defines then how you exactly want to absorb both the infinity and an arbitrary number of finite terms. But you're always required to choose that. You're, you, when you specify a normalization scheme, you specify it um, in a way that relates to some observable quantities. So that would be a mass-dependent renormalization scheme, or you could, you could construct a mass independent regularization or normalization scheme uh, where you define things like an MS bar mass. So actually, appropriately, what this, another way to think about this, if you wanted to think about it technically, is what this is actually is telling you, what this really is, is the difference between um, a pole mass and an MS bar mass. In other words, it's the difference between what you would use as an observable in a mass dependent regularization scheme and a mass independent regularization scheme. Okay, and the disagreement between those two is still telling you, it's telling you there's a notion of a finite mass threshold that exists in your theory that is separating those two definitions of a mass scale. All right. So I apologize for that technical excursion, but it, it's an assurance to you that, that even if I choose in a, some perverse way to define my 
renormalization scheme to absorb that as well, I will find that if I compare observables at different scales, or if I, observe, if I compare different definitions of, of an observable, this quantity will always appear, okay? Right. Okay. Uh, and the last thing to emphasize before, I cut, before we go off to coffee, because I know we all need coffee, is you could flip the argument and you can ask, what if I had the theory where I made the scalar heavy and I wanted to keep the fermion light? Is there any problem with keeping the fermion light? So I can now ask the same question where I flip the roles and I ask about a low energy effective theory of the fermion. And here there's no problem, right? I can go ahead and I can calculate the fermion mass at low energies. And there is a finite correction to the fermion mass, but it's proportional to the fermion mass, not the scalar mass, right? This is just a manifestation of the fact that the mass parameter of the fermion is technically natural. If I take the mass of the fermion to zero, there's an enhanced symmetry, a chiral symmetry, that guarantees that radiative corrections to the fermion mass are proportional to violations of the chiral symmetry. In other words, that finite piece is now proportional to the fermion mass itself. Okay, so we don't have the same problem for the fermion, we just have it for the scalar. And again, this is a manifestation of the fact that the scalar mass is not a technically natural parameter, but the fermion mass is. Okay, I think that's enough for this first lecture, so let's all uh, take a break and go have some coffee. Thank you.